Hi everyone, Myra here, back with another installment of the Dancing Cats of Applesap. Time for story time. We are continuing on with chapter 11. Be comfy. It took Miss Tooney two full hours to brush up the cats, what with chasing them down to sh chase what with chasing down the shy ones who slunk away to hide and fighting off the braver ones who wanted a second through. Meanwhile, Melba worked at the counter making signs on some dusty pieces of poster board she had found on a shelf. She found watercolor paints too and brushes and the thing I like about plain old drug stores is they've got everything about ever anybody ever needed, Melba told Miss Tooney as she rinsed off her brush between colors. Here's Snowflake, bawled Miss Tooney. Groping under the candy rack. Here, Ozzy. Here, Butch. Want a cherry? They've got huge modern drug stores in Glowville and Hopsburg, but no soda fountain to sit down at. They have aisles and aisles of, some, of things like popcorn poppers and dried flowers and giant boxes of washing detergent, but they never have what you really need, like turtle food, said Maba, carefully painting a large red O. We've got turtle food, grunted Miss Tooney. She hauled Snowflake out by the tail. I know, said Melba. I used to have a turtle. In Glowville, you have to go to a special pet store to get turtle food. And you have to go to another special store to get your brother a jackknife for his birthday. And even another store to get a little bit of wrapping paper you need to wrap it up with. At the huge drug store, all they have is huge rolls that cost $5 each. We have jackknives and little bits of wrapping paper, announced Miss Tooney proudly. She held the poor, wriggling snowflake by her scruff and fluffed up her tail. The Super Queen doesn't have a comic book rack, Melba continued, and it doesn't carry water pistols anymore. Probably why they're still in business and we're not, grumped Miss, T Miss Tooney. All these little things we've got don't make us any money, she looked at Melba sharply. How do you know what the Super Queen carries if you never go there, she asked. Victor tells me, Melba shrugged. The Super Queen isn't my kind of place. Miss Tooney creaked up off the floor and brushed down her skirt which was flecked with ten different colors of cat fur. If I may say so, she said, coming over to look at Melba's signs, your kind of place is about to go out of business because nobody ever comes in it. So what are you going to do if this march works? If this, if it works, we'll have customers jamming every corner of the, and kids ordering hot fudge sundaes and all sorts of people you don't want to see. Melba gulped and turned out. Melba gulped and turned to the old lady. But so will you, she cried. Miss Tooney stared at her. Then she glanced down at Melba's large, gay, open Sunday sign. And at another one, she painted further along the counter that said, Cats March for Jigs. Introduct introductory offer. One free ice cream cone. Come and get it. We should get started if we're going, said Miss Tooney. Are we going, said Melba. Miss Tooney started, stared dismally at the signs, and Melba, feeling her jitter stir, Around in that deep place wondered suddenly how Victor's groundhog was getting along. He was in a tight spot, all right. If he came up for food, he'd be shot, and if he didn't come up, he'd starve to death. Melba couldn't decide what she would do if she were the groundhog. She guessed the best way might be to stay put in her hole and wait for the hunters to go away. But knowing Victor, he'd probably be up all night, so perhaps a dash across the field for new territory would, after all, be the better plan. Miss Tooney had turned around to survey the cats. All the brushing and fluffing had stirred them up. Now they were swirling to and fro across the floor, their groups massing and breaking apart and remassing like rain clouds on a windy day. They were edgy, uncertain about what was coming next, and irritated that their old routines had been interrupted. Some streamed into the back room, thinking perhaps that Mr. Jiggs would suddenly appear there, they padded back out again to search the store with wide-open, worried eyes. Look at them, said Miss Tooney. They know something is up, and they don't like it. I don't either, said Miss Mel said Melba. I don't either, sighed Miss Tooney. But there's no help in that. One way or another, this drugstore isn't going to be the same comfortable, out-of-the-way place we've gotten used to. What if the Super Queen crowd starts coming here, whispered Mella. I guess I'll be back to sponging off and worrying about clean spoons, groaned Miss Tooney. They looked at each other nervously, and then out of the blue, Miss Tooney snickered. Well, that's the limit, she giggled. Here we are, scared to death of what will happen if the march works, and scared of what will happen if it doesn't. 
Makes us sound about as spineless as jigs. Melba laughed, but not very heartily. I didn't like to say so, since I was the one who thought up the plan to begin with, but what scares me most is the marching itself. I never was very good at getting up in front of people. I'm not so hot in that department myself, admitted Miss Tooney, only I thought I wouldn't mention it and snarl. Snarl the works. I've always been one for having a counter between me and the rest of the world. She glared accusingly at the soda counter. Fountain, soda fountain counter. Listen, said Miss Tooney, just because we feel spineless doesn't mean we have to act that way. That's right, declared Melba. Miss Tooney's confession about the counter made her feel braver. Well, when it comes right down to it, you won't find me hiding behind the shades of some dark house, bellowed Miss Tooney. Me either, cried Melba. I guess nobody can take this drugstore away from me if I don't want them to, yelled Miss Tooney, springing into the midst of the swirling cats. Hooray, screamed Melba. Miss Tooney put her finger to her lips and blew the long, low whistle that shot every cat's tail straight up in the air. Come on, cats, shouted Melba, and a minute later, an impatient if somewhat bedraggled line surged out the front door. At the head went Miss Tooney in a coat whose pockets were temporarily stuffed with candy bars. There was, however, one cat who, for reasons of his own, did not respond to Miss Tooney's hoot. While the other cats moved haughtily out to the sidewalk, Butch turned his old beaten body around and limped off into the back room. There he set up, watch again under Mr. Jig's guitar, casting worried glances around the room. Well, by now, maybe you've been noticing out of the corner of your eye. Melba has been sitting on the phone for over an hour. She has already talked to ten people at the Guinness Book of World Records. Five of them were secretaries who told her she had the wrong department. Three were switchboard operators who said the department she wanted was busy and she, did she wish to hold. She certainly did. The remaining two were line barters who came on through a mistake in the connection did, and didn't know who they were supposed to be talking to either. Melba, to kill time while she waited for the right department to show up, has been drawing pictures of the cats on her mother's doodle pad next to the foam. There's Butch about to crunch on another cherry. This one is Snowflake, who, according to Melba, is so smart she's figured out how to open the cash register by leaning on the sale button with her paw. She likes the ring the register makes when she does it. But she won't do it if anyone is watching, said Melba now, cocking the phone's receiver on her shoulder in a professional way. When anyone looks at her, she acts stupid, like any dumb house cat in the world. A lot of Miss Tooney's cats are like that. We've got one cat called Fudge, on account of his chocolate color, who can answer the phone. Of course, he doesn't say anything after he knocked it off the hook. He waits for Miss Tooney to pick it up. Still, you've got to admit, it's pretty remarkable for a cat. But Fudge won't a answer if you are watching him. He gets embarrassed and goes off to hide somewhere. He's afraid he couldn't do it if someone were looking, or that he'll be laughed at. I don't blame him at all. I used to feel that way. At school, I was afraid to hold up my hand to answer a question, even when I knew the answer cold. I was afraid to walk across the room even before Irma pinched me. When people looked at me, I felt as if a big, icy spotlight was shining down in my face and I'd freeze. Victor said I made people nervous by freezing that way. Stay loose, he told me. Nobody wants to talk to a frozen up person. It makes them feel frozen up too. Stay loose. Stay loose. That's what I was saying to myself over and over as I started on that cat march. I didn't think about how the cats were doing. I hardly noticed them. I suppose Snowflake and Fudge and all of them were shaking like leaves themselves being out on that murderous street. But I was too busy worrying about whether I'd make it myself to pay attention to them. Shyness will do that to you, Melba explains. You spend so much time thinking about yourself that you forget to think about other people. For instance, if I'd looked more closely, maybe I could have found out that a lot of other kids in my class at school were shy too, and afraid to raise their hands sometimes, and scared of Irma, which I discovered lately nearly everybody was. If I hadn't had the spotlight in my face, maybe I would have noticed how the cats were becoming jumpier and more frightened with each block we marched, how their tails were cur curling down between their legs and their ears were flattening against their heads. Miss Tooney couldn't see it. She was walking on ahead. It wasn't her fault the cats went wild. I'm the one who could have stopped them, but... Hush! Melba interrupted herself. Hello? 
Yes, this is Melba Morris calling about the Dancing Cats of Apple Sap. Chapter 12. <coughs> Excuse me a second while I take a drink. <coughs> Alrighty. Chapter 12. Back at Jig's drugstore, Butch curled his tail more tightly around his body. Otherwise, he remained motionless and at the foot of the chair. Ten minutes passed. Then about the time the Grand Cat March was passing through Apple Sap Center, Causing the first townsfolk to blink their eyes, there came the sound of a key in the front lock. Mr. Jiggs, finding the door open, shuffled in and gazed dejectedly at the empty store. Cats, said Mr. Jiggs in a low voice. There was no answer. He shuffled over to the soda fountain counter and peered behind it. Then he wiped his hand over the top of his bald head and went to the back room. As soon as he appeared, Butch got up and ran to rub himself fondly against the old man's worn trousers. Where is everyone? asked Mr. Jiggs. He bent over to pick up Butch, who was showing no sign of shyness Melba knew so well. Mr. Jiggs retrieved his guitar from the chair and sat down heavily. He pulled a guitar string from his pocket and set to work replacing the broken string. Butch, perched on his lap, watched every moment, uh, every movement with keen interest. After a while, Mr. Jiggs spoke to Butch in the tones of someone long used to confiding in cats. They're up to something, aren't they, Miss Tooney and the others? And you don't like the looks of it. Well, am I right? I appreciate you looking after my instrument all night. Do the same for you sometime. The cat watched Mr. Jiggs closely. All that whispering by the soda fountain last night. There's a plan afoot, I don't doubt. Don't worry, added Mr. Jiggs dismally. It won't come to anything. Nothing ever comes to anything these days. He drew his thumb across the strings to test the new one for sound. It was flat. Slowly, patiently, he tuned the guitar until its old mournful chords rang harmoniously again. Butch's ears perked up. He leapt to the floor and stood eagerly looking up at the old man. Ah, oh, old friend, sighed Mr. Jiggs. What a time we had last night, eh? Never have, I, never have I seen cats perform so well. We've had some good parties in our day. Yes, we have. He strummed softly and sadly. Having you cats about, well, it's been a pleasure, if I may say so. Never would have thought it. Never did like cats particularly. But then he looked sympathetically, sympathetically at Bit, Butch. I don't suppose your cats have much interest in music before we got together. We've made a strange mixture between us. Crazy, some would say. Mr. Jiggs stif stifled a giddy laugh. Then another thought struck, it, struck him. He sat up and narrowed his eyes at Butch. Don't you ever, he began fiercely, don't you ever dare tell Miss Tooney what's been going on these last few years. She doesn't like me, never has. I couldn't stand the way she'd laugh and spread the news all over town. Jiggs has really lost his mind now, she say, playing orchestra to a bunch of loony cats. Mr. Jiggs' face flushed red with embarrassed anger, and it wouldn't do you cats any good either. This is a private business between you and me. Don't want people stepping in and making a mess of it. I wouldn't trust them, not for a minute, Mr. Diggs slammed his fist down against the screen, strings, producing a harsh, harsh thump that flattened Butch, Butch's ears. But a moment later, he relaxed. Well, well, he said, I'm sorry for how it must end. Still, store or no store, it couldn't last forever. I'm getting old. He wiped his hand over his head. I stumbled. I stumble and shuffle and forget things. Look how I forgot my guitar last night in the worry of saying our goodbyes. He shook his head gloomily at Butch, who stood rigid at his feet. His word meant, words meant nothing to the cat. They washed through his head like an incomprehensible wind, sometimes fierce and frightening, sometimes slow and soothing. It was the way of all humans. Butch knew from long experience to speak and speak, and at the end to have said nothing of importance. The cat, old cat shifted his weight watchfully. He was waiting for Mrs. Mr. Jiggs' voice to stop and for that other language, the one he understood and craved, to begin. He was waiting for the music, the fast, gay music that had become over the years on lonely winter nights and parched summer evenings through times of pain and times of suspicion, a way of talking between friends. We are here together, Mr. Jiggs' music said appealing to all the cats, but especially the butch, oldest and most deeply wounded. Outside the world is strange and dark, and trucks prowl the streets 
searching for us with their lights. Out there is uncertainty and danger. But here, while the sound lasts, we are sheltered. Here we can relax and be ourselves. Act like cats, act like men, who cares? Sing the music. How we act, let us dance because we are safe. Butch mewed a plaintful mew, but the old man's eyes were not on his guitar. They seemed to rest on something far off across the room. After a long time, he stirred. Come on, said Mr. Jiggs, getting up at last. Butch leapt for the door. I'll sit out for a bit while you have a sniff around. It's not a bad day as days go. Mr. Jiggs carried his chair out front, placed it in the open doorway of the shop, and sat down again in the broad sunlight. There he strummed morosely while Butch nosed into the bushes, and there a minute later a piece of the day's sparkle caught onto his fingers. It caused a happy little tune to flare up, and in a flash Butch was at his feet. Ha! cried Mr. Jiggs. That was a pretty one. Well, I'll give you another scene as there's something in the air that stirs it up. Checking to see that no one was around to hear, he played another twinkling chord, and then a gay strutting melody wholly unlike the mournful sounds Melba was used to hearing in the store. Then, feeling the music put cheer into his old bones, he let his fingers go and launched her into a full-fledged song that danced up the, the treetops and made the birds fall silent with admiration. This was what Butch had been waiting for. In pure ecstasy, the old battered cat rose on his back feet, forgetting his injuries, forgetting that he was a cat at all, and bound to obey the shy laws of catness. His head went back to, the, to face the sky. His tail curled and recurled around his body. His feet began a dreamy dance pattern that swirled him around slowly at first, then let us dance because we are safe faster and faster. There's old Butch dancing. Oops, sorry, I hit the camera. Is that focusing? Ah, hopefully you can see him. Now you've got it, Butch, roared Mr. Jiggs over the music, and neglecting all caution, he plays, played one more loudly still, completely lost in his own performance. He played so loudly, in fact, that he drowned out the sound of approaching footsteps, or one would say the drum of approaching paws, for at that moment an unruly herd of ninety-nine cats was already turning down Nun Street, thundering ecstatically toward the source of the gay talking music. That is end of chapter 12. Stay tuned next time. Uh, tune in next time, I should say, for chapter 13. Thanks everybody for watching. Meow for now.